idols. Idols. Do we have them? Does our world have them? Maybe, maybe even does the world worship them? You know, idols are all around us because society tells us they're idols. American Idol. American Idol, TV for I think over 20 years. Pretty easy to idolize sports figures, movie stars, rock stars, politicians. The list goes on. Well, I, I get curious, what drives that in us? We, we see a public side of these these figures, and we're probably fascinated with them. Maybe, maybe there's a side of us that, that we, would, we would like to be that ourselves, right? We marvel at their life of luxury. People yelling their names. <laughs> I don't know. Do we think maybe that admiration is a little misplaced? Okay. If so, where should we place our love and admiration? Well, I think we're going to find out today that Paul has a little something to say about that. So we're going to read scripture. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 10, 14 through 22. And I'm in the NLT. So, my dear friends, flee from the worship of idols. You are reasonable people. Decide for yourselves if what I'm saying is true. When we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread... Aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. Think about the people of Israel. Weren't they unified, united by eating the sacrifices at the altar? What am I trying to say? Am I saying that food offered to idols has some significance? Or that idols are real gods? No, not at all. I'm saying that these sacrifices are offered to demons, not to God. And I don't want you to participate with demons. You cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and from the cup of demons too. You cannot eat at the Lord's table and at the table of demons too. And the last verse, what? Do we dare rouse the Lord's jealousy? Jealousy. Do we think we are stronger than he is? Let's pray. Lord, What a beautiful sight. I I wish everyone in this church would have the opportunity to stand here and see your people in this magnificent room. Your people, Lord, here for one reason, to worship you, to love you, to learn about you. Lord, I thank you this morning for Pastor Richard's prayer, and he's... He read my heart, Lord. I'm blessed to be here in your pulpit, but I'm nothing but a messenger. I'm nothing. Just humble me, Lord, but I want everyone in this room today to glorify you through your word. And I'll just give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. If you're a visitor here or you don't... uh
don't know me, I'm, I'm not Sean. I'm not the pastor. <laughs> Real quick, my name is Robert Jackson. I'm a member here, and I am in the EMC Haggard School of Ministry. And I'm humbled to be here today in the pulpit of my church, my family. So, uh, real quick, I've been blessed to preach in the local area for several years now. But typically, at early services, where time management is critical, we, we, have, to, we have to knock our message out because uh, Sunday school or something is going to follow. So you can imagine how happy I was <laughs> when Sean told me I had a full two hours <laughs> for my message. Ah, it is like an hour and a half, but you know, you, you get the point. You know, um, I want to get right to the word, but I learned something else this morning too getting ready here. Patrick Dale wired me up here and said, number one, he cuts me off when we're singing. Okay, Diana, talk to him. <laughs> and number two, he said, if I go too long or get off uh, message, he kills the microphone. So I love you, Patrick. <laughs> you know, last thing, I, because I, try, I, I was telling Pastor uh, Richard this morning, I try so hard to let, I have a script. Don't we all have a script? But I try to let the spirit move me. I, I have done this for a while. But you know what? I'm a little nervous this morning. But you know what? I'm glad I'm nervous. Because I don't ever want to be comfortable when I'm given the opportunity to be here. If I'm comfortable, something's wrong. Something's wrong. I need, I need to be uncomfortable. I need to be receptive. Let's get into this message. We can recap where we are in 1 Corinthians and the reason behind the letter. Sean and Carl Bowden have preached about this for several weeks. Last week, Sean opened the door to idols. So we have to remember, and I love that map I came across, and I guess it's probably not too clear. Well, it's not bad. Um, you know... Paul founded this church and it was located in an area of really great wealth and diversity of citizens. There was, a, there was a major trading hub right there and you could just almost see geographically why that would be. My first thought is, what a great place to put a church. I mean, that was pretty good, right? But as Sean told us, you know, with this wealth and diversity became depravity of all types. I mean, it was, a, it was truly a sinful place. So Paul is compelled to write this letter to the church as he's getting what he considers legitimate reports of the actions of the church that they have moved away from God. He starts in the letter that that you've been hearing for weeks talking about divisions in the church, infighting in the church, arguments in the church. None of us have ever seen that in our Christian life, right? It happens. It's sad, but it happens. He then moves his condemnation and instruction toward the overall behavior of the church the sanctity of the body, the holiness of marriage, and now he's going to talk about idolatry. As we, as we first come into this scripture reading, we're coming to clear direction from Paul. He gets to the point quickly, flee idolatry, flee, run from idolatry. Okay. Okay. Many of us are likely sitting here saying, okay, well, that was then. We don't have that now. We don't have to worry about that now. Okay, we don't make idols out of wood or bronze or whatever they make idols out of. We don't, we don't bow down and pray to these 
objects. I'll give you that. Some of you might say, come on, Robert. Don't take us down that road. We're better than, we're better than them crazy Corinthians. We're not, we're not doing that. Are we? Maybe it depends on my definition of idolatry. So call me a simple man. Whenever I'm studying for school or preparing for a message, sometimes I have to go back to basics. I want to make sure that I fully understand the language and the, and the topic that I'm discussing. So I got a pretty good idea what is meant by idols and idolatry. But maybe I ought to give it a sanity check. Smith's Bible Dictionary. The worship of deity in a visible form, whether the images are of the true God or false objects. What about good old Mr. Webster? We all love him. The worship of a physical object is a God. Okay. But number two, I don't like number two, attachment or devotion to something. <laughs> All right, well, maybe we're not them crazy Corinthians. But maybe there's something here. Maybe there's something in my heart. Maybe there's something in your heart. Something that borders on, no, I will not use the word worship. But maybe it borders on that word devotion from Webster. Oh, it could be hidden, hidden to me, hidden to you. It's part of life. During my recent interview with the EMC Board of Ministerial Relations, they asked me, what was my preaching style? I said, I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm not mature enough in my training to figure that out. In fact, I don't even know what it is I don't know. I don't even know what the styles are. I'm still working on it. But if you hadn't already noticed, I do have one style. I pick on myself. To begin with, it's, it's an easy target, right? But I pick on my weaknesses, my faults. You know, I... I, I I just look at this that it, if, I, if I open myself up and you recognize anything in me that you can share, well, look, look we, you're not alone. We, we, you can relate, we can, we can share, we can, we can fight these, these things together. When I see this scripture in Corinthians, I pray. that God would open my eyes, my heart, to see those idols that maybe are troubling me. This is not new to me or us as a people. The first two of the Ten Commandments have to do with this issue, right? Exodus 20, two through five. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, you, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall now bow down to them or worship them. Get ready, here it comes again. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. A jealous God. Let's just let that soak in a minute. We're going we're to talk about it some more. I, I got to tell you, when I was preparing this message, that, that was a word that just I couldn't get away from. God knew 
that when he made us, he made us to worship him. He made us for worship. We were designed by the great human designer for our minds and our hearts to worship. And if we don't worship the true God in the true way, in the biblical way, well, we're likely to be guilty of false worship. We will worship an idol or some substitute we have for an idol. We're not going to worship nothing. We will worship a God substitute if we do not worship the true God. I said earlier our idols are not generally made of wood or iron or bronze or marble or stone. I don't know what they made idols of. Whatever they made them out of. Shaped into some statue or symbolic figure that, that we all bow to. But I also said we really want to we really want to peel this on you back and talk about it. Whatever, whatever dominates your time and your mind, whatever you hold close to the very core of your being, if it's not the triune God, if it's not the Father, Son, and the Spirit, it is a created thing, created by me, created by us. It's an idol. It's what you live for. It's what you can't live without. In many ways, I think that's what some people are dealing with today and what Paul was dealing with in Corinthians. We're going to dig a little deeper into this scripture again and just see where there just might be a parallel to today, to me, to us. You know, the message is clear. Paul opens up verse 14, flee from idolatry. I mean, to me, I mean, he just couldn't have been any more. It ain't like, ah, y'all not y'all to rethink that whole idol thing. No, flee, flee. So we need to be aware of this, as we say down here, call a spade a spade. We we have to take it seriously and look again at the urgent command in verse fourteen. Therefore, dear friends, flee from idolatry. We opened the door earlier about idols. Okay, we agree. We don't make idols. We don't worship them. But back to Webster's definition that kind of kind of hit me. Attachment or devotion to something. Where do we stand there? What are some of the obvious ones that I might have, that you might have? How about money, wealth, status? How about this wonderful, productive invention of a tool that from a Educational perspective, business perspective, professional perspective is just wonderful. You know what? This thing may be jealous too, because they don't like to be put down. I told you that I love to pick on myself when I do. Few things go to my heart more than after we've settled in for the night and, you know, I'm doing my thing and Diana's doing hers and I meander into the bedroom and sit on the bed and I got this thing in my hand and I look over and Diane's reading the Bible. But, hmm. Hmm. Movies, music. Sports, can anybody say NCAA March Madness? Addictions of all types. 
Addictions are not just what you think, drug or alcohol. Addictions of all types. Leisure activities. All right, I'm going down and going down the road here, y'all. Bear with me. How about church? Not what I'm looking at. I'm looking at God's people. How about church, the physical building? Okay, Robert, you went down the wrong road. What are you thinking up there? Why would you mention that? When Diana and I were looking for a new church home, we visited around. We, we came here several times before we turned. We were here the first Sunday that Max Edwards stood right here and delivered a message. We came in that day and I grabbed the bulletin and I was stopped in my tracks. The title of the message was gonna be Nice Castle Where's the King. Nice Castle. Max went on to say, this is just a facility. This is just a tool in our toolbox for our ministry and our real miss mission. He said, I remember it like yesterday. He said, you may come back next week and there's basketball marks on that wall from the kids playing basketball. At some point, you're going to walk around here and there's going to be stains in the carpet. But we don't, come, we don't come here to worship a building, but the king who lives here. Amen? Now, I'm being very careful here, but I felt it in my heart. I am so thankful for this facility. I'm so thankful thankful for the godly people who dedicated their time, their resources, their money, and their effort to build this. Oh, we are blessed as a congregation. But folks, if that carpet stained the mar, it's still going to be God's kingdom, God's home, and it will still be used for the mission. I knew at that very moment that day, I said, I found home. I, I don't have to look nowhere else. All right, what about these other things I've discussed? Have I been guilty of viewing some of these items the wrong way in my life? Oh, yes. Wow. It's ugly this morning. I need to go to church, worship, but I just, I just want to lay in bed today. Wow, it's beautiful outside. All right. I need to go to church to worship, but I really want to do the yard work or go fishing, right, Brother Bruce? Love you, buddy. Or something. You see the theme here? I think sometimes we have to go back again to basics. What are we taught as we mature as Christians. What are we taught that God wants more than anything else from us? The very, I'm not going to go there. What he wants from us. He wants a personal relationship. That's what God wants. He wants us to depend on him. <clears throat> he wants our love. Yes, he's a jealous God, and I'm glad. Okay, I am by no means saying that those things I listed and those examples I gave are wrong or we should take out of our lives. Because the other thing that I believe with all my heart, that as a loving God, he don't want us to feel imprisoned by our relationship. He wants, to come, he wants us to come to him out of an act of love, not at the point of a sword. It, it's, it's a mutual loving relationship, and that's what he wants from us. 
So what do we take out of this? I'm saying we should guard ourselves against those things, and if we want to call them idols, those things that have the potential to separate us from the very relationship God so desires and we so need. Okay. Do I sometimes go on vacations that include a Sunday? I love to pick on people, so I'm back at Bruce. <laughs> Did Bruce and I used to have to work Sundays in the old boat yard, whether we wanted to or not, my brother? Do we sometimes really, really, really just want Sunday to be a day of rest. I don't want to get up and dress up. I don't want to do nothing. Of course. Of course we do. I think the message here is we need to be aware of what are our priorities. So we're going to look a little bit further in these same scriptures. Let's go back through 15 through 20. You are reasonable people. Decide for yourself if what I'm saying is true. When we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. Think about the people of Israel. Weren't they united by eating the sacrifices at the altar? What am I... What? <laughs> What I am trying to say, am I saying that food offered to idols has some significance or that idols are real gods? No, not at all. I'm saying that these sacrifices are offered to demons, not to God, and I don't want you to participate with demons. You cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot eat at the Lord's table and at the table of demons. Okay, okay. So on the surface, we're going to say, I'm sorry. What does that have to do with idols and idolatry? Okay, fair question when you take it out of context. But Sean's been in Corinthians, well, whatever, many weeks. So let's go back a little in 1 Corinthians. We've seen in this letter to Corinthians what I... What I what I like to say, a little of the political side of Paul coming out. So remember, Paul was an educated man from a learned family. Let's think back about the old Paul. Remember Saul? You know, he himself, as we know, was, was politically connected prior to his conversion. The point being, Paul is skilled to communicate with these Corinthians. So what he was dealing with in Corinth was a very diverse culture. That the resident Greeks were accustomed to idols. I think either Paul, I mean, <laughs> either Son or Carl preached about this. There were, there were idols everywhere. You know, there was an idol for harvest and an, an idol for this, you know, love idol. They were everywhere for every reason. But here's what I love. I always love to get back to basics. Paul's mission in Corinth was the same as it was everywhere he, he went. Introduce Christ and lead conversions. That was his mission. And I love when you, when you study Paul, he gets it. I mean, he, he clearly understands what God gifted him to do. Okay. How basic. So I think what Paul is showing us here, you don't accomplish that mission by alienating the very people, right, that you're witnessing to. You will see Paul, shall we say, play something of a game in this area understanding he has to at least to some degree acknowledge, acknowledge, not accept, 
acknowledge the culture he's in. So we saw in chapters 8 and 9, Paul was addressing this local culture and of food and drink to the idols, offering the food and drink to the idols. He was careful to say in 8 and 9, well, there's really nothing wrong with eating this, this offering. The underlying message being, it's just food and drink. There's no sacred or, or holy element to these offerings. But you're going to see now when he is going to address the, church, the Corinthian church and the leadership there, he takes a little different tone. So Sean mentioned last week that when Paul needs to, right, <clears throat> He doesn't sugarcoat to the church. He dives right in. So now in the scripture I just read, he goes on to say, but for you who are believers, you who are committed to Christ, you who are the spiritual leaders in this diverse area, you be careful. Paul is driving home here the point to this church, these leaders, these believers, you have clear direction. You don't worship at the table of the idols. You worship at the Lord's table to break of the bread, drink of the cup in the new covenant with Christ. He's really just trying to put things in perspective. So this culturally diverse area the leadership knows where their true commitment and their true heart has to be. I, I, you know, I'm probably repeating myself. I'm going to say it again. I, I've kind of preached out of the Corinthians a lot lately, and, uh, and I just appreciate this fine line Paul walks here. He has to acknowledge the custom to the area. He, he, he can't come in like some ball of fire and start, tearing at the very root of what these people believe. He has to come lightly. He has to tear at it a little bit of time by using God's words and works. Don't we marvel? Don't we marvel how we, how we read and study the word and we just relate? This is the magic to me, that we just relate it back Paul's tactics here, pretty good lesson for all of us, right? What do you think? We're not going to win anybody at the tip of the sword either. We're going to win with love, and we're going to win with understanding the people that we're witnessing to where they are in their life. This brings us to the last scripture, 22. What do we dare to rouse the Lord's jealousy? There it is. And do we think we are stronger than he is? Well, we're back to this jealousy issue. I was using um, McDonald's Bible commentary during the prep of this message. And they provided an interesting an interesting quote for this scripture. Love cannot, love cannot but be jealous of wandering affections. It would not be love if it did not resent unfaithfulness. Paul's message here is clear. If we love our God, why would we dare taunt him with other idols, real or imagined, created, materially, not materially? Why? Why would we raise his natural jealousy? How, how is that possibly honoring him? This is not an action of love. 
And I like that last little piece. Do we think we are stronger than him? Hmm. You know what I read there? I think Paul is saying, be careful, folks, be careful. You worship a loving God, but you don't want to, you don't want to rile God. You don't, you don't. None of us want to be dishonored. I, what I loved about this, this quote was, can't we all relate to this? We're in a loving, most of us are in a loving, committed relationship. Why? In our personal life, why? Why would we want to dishonor that person if we love them? Why would we want to dishonor God? I'm going to ask uh, Jeff to come up and uh, I, I'm still new at this. Um, but my prayer is always that um, that when I'm here, I'm sensitive to what the Lord is saying. So as uh, Jeff and his team get prepared, I'm going to close in prayer, but if there, if there are things in your life that, that are drawing your focus away from, from God, you know, last week, one of the things I've loved from this church from day one is this altar is always open. And, I, you know, we have seen some miraculous things the last few weeks. We saw this service stop because of the Spirit, a, a spontaneous movement of love. I was sitting here last week and, and, and watching Sean and just the response, uh, people with their hearts. So if there is something in your life that, that's got you and, and you need to unload it, but you know, A lot of us have been here in life. If you're sitting out there and your heart is just about to beat out of your chest and you know something's happening, this altar is open for you too. And I promise you, C.D. White and his, and his uh, Stephen ministers and, and uh, you know, the staff here, uh, you know, Pastor Richard, people in here that love you if you if you if you feel that and you need to come up here you're not alone this is a loving congregation but the other thing that's just working on me right now too is if you're hearing that chest is a thumping and you say man I just mm, I don't want to get up in front of all these people and walk okay there's loving people Pastor Jeff, Pastor Richard, Pastor C.D., myself, Stephen Ministers. You can say, can we go to a private room? I got questions. Yes. Whatever your heart's telling you. But if you need to unload, this is the place to unload. I'm going uh, to close in prayer and, and, and let Jeff take over and Lord, thank you for thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us unconditionally, no matter how broken we are, no matter how whatever word I could come up with. What did Billy Graham used to say, just as I am? You love it, you love us just as I am. 
Lord, continue. To, we pray, continue to have us focus on you and not, not anything that would separate us from you. Nothing. Just have us focus on you. Lord, as Pastor Jeff and, and his team uh, close us in song, Lord, just, we just pray a special blessing on, on everyone here. Everyone. Just open their heart, Lord, and just open, uh, open, their, open their heart to be receptive of you, Lord. We'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name.